All right, hello everybody. I can still take these on, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, this is the third week, and as my calendar says, this lesson will be scheduled for the twenty fifth of March, okay. Monday, the twenty fifth of March. Um, so we're going to get into uh, the moving of people for culture and how cultures can be spread, mixed, what have you, influence other cultures. So moving in peoples and different variables, all right? So let me uh, head on to our usual setup. Okay, share the screen. Get the material. Let me minimize myself here. Take that away. Hmm. Where's my uh, beginning? Uh, I hit slideshow. Now go to the You should be set. Fantastic. Okay. Looking good. So hopefully we have some interesting, more relatable stuff, information for us this week, right? Since we usually start in the ancient times, okay? So again, your class is uh, abbreviation ANT 101, Introduction to Anthropology. Okay, you see that which week it is. So here we go. The processes, which means many process, like the process is one, so processes is many, of culture flow and culture change. So there's many ways that culture flows and culture change. And hopefully we can touch on some of those here. So if cultural anthropology ever hoped or imagined that it was finding pristine, pristine means, uh, well, the regular meaning of pristine is really, really clean and untouched, okay. Uh, what they're using here with pristine is that the cultures uh, themselves are untouched by outside people, right? They are what they are. So like Aztec Mexico before the Spanish arrived, something like that. And then primordial means the very beginning cultures, okay? Not a lot of the fusion of what we have today, okay? Uh, Malinowski, which is an author, uh, dashed that hope, so he destroyed it. In his 1945 book, The Dynamics of Culture Change, in which he asserted or opinionated, put forth his belief that the figment of the uncontaminated native has been dropped from research and field and study. Figment um, usually has been used in the term like figment of your imagination. That's the old way, like, I don't know, my grandfather's time. If someone said, I saw a ghost, right? They would say, uh, no, I'm sorry. It was a figment of your imagination. You, you know, had spicy food or you were drunk. So this figment, so this unbelievable notion of uncontaminated self, that's a word we've probably got to use now in this uh, pandemic period. So like untouched native has been dropped for research and field and study. So we're gonna find out like this author says, no, everybody's always been touched by something else. We just didn't know about it. That's, again, that's his belief. Not everybody believes this, right? Mm. So there is further states, the cogent or reliable, solid reason for this is that the uncontaminated native does not exist anymore. So he's basically saying the same thing in easier English there. Mm. Instead, what exists today is not a primitive culture in isolation, but one in contact in process of change. And at best, 
and fascinatingly elements of the old culture are being revived with a secondary almost ethnographic interest which we went over ethnographic the first two weeks in racial history customary law and the artistic and intellectual achievements of their race it's a lot of big wordage there that is peoples are becoming like anthropologists of their own culture okay Now, again, I, I always like to state on these different authors that that's their take. Not everybody believes with them. Like I said, this is the processes of culture and we should have many outlooks on this. Like, for example, I, I could debate this because I don't know if you're aware, it's been in the news recently, I guess last year, there's an island close to India and uh, it has native people there. Now, I say, like he says, nobody's untouched, right? But they're more or less untouched. Yes, they've had some people go there and give them some food or, uh, I don't know, some kind of beddings or something. But uh, that's been very few and far between. And most of those people, like the last present guy who went last year and said, I'm going to give them Christianity. They killed him. Okay. So there has not been an anthropologist there studying these people or a mix of other people. They've been that way on that island. Or who's to say? I could say thousands of years. It could be longer, right? And they don't look Indian. They look African. So the last guy I think was last year and they warned him it's illegal to go there. India, I guess, owns the island, but they don't bother to do anything there. They leave the people alone. And they shot him full of arrows as he was coming off the uh, boat onto the shore. So that's how untouched they are. So again, look at things as uh, with as many viewpoints as you can. Okay, so continuing. As dynamic systems, cultures not only reproduce existing forms, right, they've already existed, but also produce novel, what we tended to use for like the high level forms. Two of the basic uh, cultural processes for producing novelty are innovation and diffusion. So you know folks, usually when I give you two things like this, they pop up as a question. Okay, so be aware of that. Innovation is, here comes the explanation, the discovery or invention of something new by members of a society. Such novelty is never entirely new, but uses, combines, or reinterprets existing elements and is perceived through the lens of the existing culture, which to me, how can you not? right? Everybody does that from whatever culture they're at. And now let's go on to the diffusion uh, definition. Diffusion or diffusion refers to the spread of cultural elements between societies and therefore across social boundaries. This presupposes contact between peoples and flow of ideas practices, objects, and individuals between groups. While this process has sometimes been seen as foreign, even destructive to local culture, it is really nothing more than normal cultural transmission, really, mm. learning and sharing, except trans locally. Okay, so continuing here. Middle. Neither innovation nor diffusion typically entails or involves, that's what entails means, the simple automatic acceptance of new cultural elements. So listen to that, the simple automatic. So we just simply accept the new culture. That doesn't always happen. That's what they're trying to say. Usually a complex and unpredictable process follows in which some members of the group may adopt the change while others do not, or they refuse. So uh, my experience and 
Mexico, for example, uh, became a Christian country, but people who have strong Indian roots, not only Aztec, there's a multitude of Indians, you know, Huasteco, uh, Totonaca, Chichimeca, all kinds. So uh, for a lot of those folks, they, they didn't completely accept the Christianity or Catholicism, they mixed the two, right? And from what I understand, the same thing happened in the Caribbean where you had African folks that were originally slaves and they adopted Christianity, but they mixed in some of their own early African gods, right? And Brazil, same thing. Okay, so let's go on with how some people just automatically accept these new cultures and some people don't or they mix or change. Uh, those who adopt it may still modify it to substitute familiar materials or to conform to local tastes and values or to find new uses, applications or meanings for it. Uh, when I was traveling in Japan years ago, I discovered Japanese or Japanized, which means modified for J Japanese taste, pizza. It is only sensible that Japanese people who do not have the Western taste for sausage and pepperoni would top their pizzas with ingredients like seaweed and shrimp. Now, I can attest, agree with this uh, years ago. I remember when I was in uh, Japan, I wasn't after pizza so much, but I discovered that, um, and I was in the, for my Japanese students, I was in the Kanagawa area. Uh, and I discovered that pasta was very popular. But like the author here said that he was looking for sausage and pepperoni and pizza and couldn't find it. I was looking for spaghetti uh, meat sauce with meatballs. Pasta, spaghetti, you know, spaghetti and meatballs. Could not find it. And instead, like what he said here, so many seafood, cream sauces, shrimp sauces, uh, spaghetti and meatballs I could not find in uh, Ebina or Atsugi, maybe in Tokyo, but, but by the time I got to Tokyo, I was already on to Piggity Donkey and I fell in love with Piggity Donkey. So I stopped my uh, spaghetti and meatball search in Japan at the time. So as you can see, it, what the author is saying here is, okay, they took it, they accepted the pizza, but they said, hell no to the sausage and pepperoni, we want a more Japanese taste. That's the modifications I was talking about. So at the same time, people might resist the cultural change as Americans resist the metric system because it is too difficult or costly or merely foreign. And I can give you my own personal experience on that too. I remember when they tried to uh, institute, as they say, uh, the metric system into the US system. And uh, at least for myself, it was too difficult for me to understand. You know, 10, 10, 10, 100, whatever. So maybe there was more people like me that couldn't understand it. I don't know, but it was dropped. But they were saying, oh, this is the way Europe does it and it's better. We should do it, but it never got instituted. I, I, I for one was very happy it did. I was happy with, you know, three feet is a yard, uh, twelve inches is a foot, you know, things like that. If cultural contact is sustained or kept up over a long period of time, and if it is systematic. <laughs> and if it is especially asymmetrical, that is one society is more powerful than another, then acculturation may occur. So this is the important point here. It may, it's not a given, it's not a guarantee. 
whenever contact occurs, culture flows in both directions. That's true. But the flow may be highly imbalanced with one society accepting voluntarily or involuntarily more content than the other and being more profoundly changed. So what he's saying here is that if one side has more power than usually that side will, their side will be uh, more powerfully on the top of the mix, like 70, 30 or 80, 20, something like that. During the colonization of North America, European settlers uh, certainly acquired bits of culture from the Native Americans, including uh, knowledge of new plant species and many new words, especially place names like Mississippi and Dakota. So just to let you know, if you see these names that are really hard for you, it's like Mississippi, Dakota, Minnesota, you know, Wisconsin, they're not English. The reason why they're strange to you is because they're, the, those are the original names that the native Indian people had for it and they just, they kept them, okay? Just like, I don't know if you've noticed, but you know, you guys have come from all over the world to Los Angeles to study and you're like, Los Angeles. Well, that's actually Spanish, Los Angeles. And that means the city of angels, right? And most of your streets, Sepulveda, El Segundo, all these places, you just hear the English pronunciation, but they are actually Spanish. And they kept them, but changed the pronunciation. Native cultures were more extensively and often intentionally changed by this encounter. It's true. Frequently, the full political and institutional weight of the dominant society fell on the indigenous people in forms of military conquest, religious missionization, which means the acceptance or the forced acceptance, uh, which was Catholicism at the time by the Spanish. Geographical relocation, which they're probably talking about later times where American Indians were relocated to reservations and forced education and they use forced education in these uh, relocations, especially in boarding schools where communication with families and society was weakened, if not severed. A lot of times they had very strict rules. You couldn't speak your original language. You had to learn English and that's it, right? Okay, so um, now we're gonna go on to syncretism, globalization, and globalization, and all shall be explained, okay? Wallace's well, types of culture change and cultural movement, again, Wallace is an author, can obviously overlap and combine and all cultural movements are to an extent modern. Since participating in cultural movements, even in the name and service of tradition, it's a modern thing to do. So now we're on to Wallace's belief. And many of the tactics or ways of doing things and resources of such movements like websites, political parties and bombs are conspicuously Modern, yes. What could you say? Websites, political parties, like the, uh, what was it, the, not the shoe bomber, the, I'm trying to remember Kaczynski's, uh, he said his bombs through the mail. So, yes, that's conspicuously a modern uh, technique, all those things. Indeed, cultural anthropologists have stressed the quality of borrowing or blending that characterizes all culture, but especially contemporary culture. So the um, examples we had of the pizza and the, the pasta, it's a contemporary example. The Balbo and Kirikura women introduced above, well, they, we, 
didn't really introduce that. I thought that was kind of fluffy, but we can have some of the information here. I can explain it. They were clear, clearly borrowing culture and it may well turn out that each group will mix their new ritual with pre-existing rituals, myths, music, dance, and so on. Like I said, uh, Mexican Indians mixing their existing beliefs in the different Mexican, uh, well, like Aztec gods, like Tlaloc, the rain god, right? Quetzalcoatl, things like that. They mix them with the Catholicism. And again, that was done with African gods in the Caribbean and Brazil. So that's what they're saying here. Uh, they may also mix those rituals with modern elements such as acrylic paint, guitars, and television. Again, who knows exactly the elements that they use to mix uh, the different kinds of belief systems, okay? Cultural anthropologists use many terms for these interesting and complicated processes of cultural mixing. One common term is syncretism. So here's our first definition which means bringing together elements of different cultures in the same time and place. Might be a question, keep an eye open, I'll also repeat it. One common term is syncretism, which means bringing together elements of different cultures in the same time and place. They may entail, entail means involve, they may involve superimposing, putting one over the other, one culture on another. For example, establishing a correspondence between local spirits and foreign introduced spirits. Uh, if you don't know what spirits is, I know maybe a lot of young people go to, you see them on American bars and they'll say spirits, they mean alcohol. But what they mean here are ghosts, okay? Spirit is a ghost traditionally. More often, it takes the form of adding some local and traditional elements to the foreign modern culture to produce a third culture or a hybrid culture. Thus, anthropologists also call this process hybridization or fusion or creolization or conflation. Okay. And, uh, this also might happen in your in your own culture. Like, um, I don't know if you've heard uh, modern people because of the sexual things that are going on now, dialogues and what have you. They're using this thing like Latin X to like include everybody, whatever they think they are, right, sexually. But traditionally, for Mexicans that were, let's say, your parents were from Mexico and you were born here. Um, Maybe you spoke Spanish at home when you started elementary school, so you struggled with English, even though you were not from Mexico. And the way you were brought up was typically not, let's say, uh, uh, Caucasian or Anglo style. You kind of didn't fit in. And then when you went to Mexico, a lot of folks, their Spanish was not good enough to actually survive let's say on the streets or what have you alone in Mexico. So they felt kind of out of place and it was its own hybrid culture. And they, they named it being a Chicano or a Chicana. So it can also happen in cultures. And I've heard the same thing. Um, I had a friend here and uh, parents were from Korea and he was born here and parents wanted him to speak English. So he really didn't speak Korean and always was excited about finding his roots and going back to Korea and he went to Korea and that a lot of Korean local Korean people didn't accept him in Korea because he couldn't speak Korean and they just said well you're an American but he's Korean he's 100% Korean so these things can also happen culturally okay thus anthropologists also call this process hybridization or fusion or creolization or completion just to repeat that for you in the 21st century, this flowing and blending of cultures is often referred to or understood as part of globalization, which I'm sure we've all heard of that term by now. A process which not only intensifies the connections between societies, but also the consciousness of these connections. That is, people feel that the world is smaller and more interconnected and that what happens elsewhere, even anywhere, 
affects them in some way. In his recent survey of globalization, Thomas Highland Erickson, the author, lists a number of key forces or factors such as connection and mobility, the flow of ideas, objects, practices, money, and people, and the common concomitant, this embedding of culture from its place of origin, which means taking, let's say, American culture and putting it someplace else, as an example. Erickson quotes the esteemed or highly respected sociologist Anthony Giddens, who saw such disembedding as the lifting of social relations from local contexts of interaction and their restructuring across indefinite spans of time and space. That's a little, little too wordy there. I wouldn't choose that, so don't worry about that. And that spans or covers that themselves contracted and sped up. Okay, I can tell you something very interesting I found out a few years ago. Since, um, you know, English was uh, kind of a use of universal language as far as, let's say, technology. Tech, every country wants technology and it's spread. So the terms in English, and you've got people following American culture and wanting to have American things. Well, uh, France, and I found out France a number of years ago passed a law, very strange, but very interesting. They passed a law a number of years ago where they said, uh, we will only accept a certain amount of new English words, whether they're technological or cultural slang into being accepted into the French, you know, the French uh, language. So I thought that interesting because I mean, things go like, again, let's say you go to Mexico and you, you say, you know, in Spanish, I want to use the internet. You're like, quiero usar el internet, right? I mean, so they're using the English, right? So I don't know exactly what words, there might be a list on the, on the internet that you could find that they said, we won't take this word. We won't take that word, but uh, at least France said, no, no, no. We want to keep a certain cultural, uh, I don't know what word you want to use. Uh, it's, not, it's not superiority, but let's say higher numbers of the French. We don't want to be flooded with a lot of English slang, right? And that's their, that's their priority if they want to do that, okay? So here we go, disembedding some, which means taking out some item from its context allows it to flow more freely and to mix with circulating items in the global culture. So again, that's, hey, let's just spread this American cultural slang on things, right? Mixing is thus another of Erickson's key dimensions of globalization, such as blue jeans or hamburgers or rap music or Christianity may be found in any part of the world. Um, I was told by an older guy that uh, it is very, very rare to be able to buy blue jeans in the 70s in many places, many countries in Europe. That's before the European Union, obviously. So they had these black markets, which are kind of illegal markets where people can go and they would probably pay way too much of a price to get American items and blue jeans were one right? And then uh, that's before rap music, so it would probably be rock and roll music. And then I met a guy from Thailand in the late 80s, and he told me the same thing, you know, hey, brother, you know, he tell people, I've come to, to Bangkok, and I'll show you where you can get blue jeans and American items. That's not the case now. There's been too much mixing, and things are available uh, all over the world. Uh, but once again, because culture is a holistic phenomenon, which means involving everybody and everything, those disembedded bits of culture like chemical elements, okay, he's making a metaphor here, may react in unprecedented combinations. So he's saying, you know, since it's spread all over the world and every country receiving this, we'll make it easy, this American culture, you don't know, every country is gonna have a different way. You know, he's talking about like, like acidic explosions and stuff, but what he means is you don't know the end form, how they're going to come out, just like in Japan, you know, pizza with seafood, 
there's no sausage or pepperoni. There's probably pepperoni now, or probably Tokyo always had it, right? Uh, so, like he says here, like chemical elements may react in unprecedented combinations. And they may be reworked and reinterpreted in their new context. Oh, I'll give you one here. Okay, just to let you know. I don't know how many of you folks go to, this is a reverse way, okay? Go to Taco Bell. Okay. And maybe you like Taco Bell food. But uh, if you bring a person from Mexico, person that's 100% Mexican, not a guy that's born here, you show him the Taco Bell menu, they'll say, what the hell is this? We don't have this food here. So this is like what the Japanese did with the pizza and pasta. Americans did and reworked this funky menu, which I don't know what you want to call it, you know, American Max or whatever. And it appeals to American people. But like I, I know them, there is no Enchirito in Mexico, right? I'm sorry, it, it doesn't exist, for example or the other bell beefers or crunch wrap or none of that stuff doesn't exist. That's Mexicans food brought it, uh, changed by Americans and that's their unprecedented combinations, right? So like he says here, these items may be reworked and reinterpreted in their new context. Japanese pizza was one example. The way that McDonald's adjusts its menu for local tastes and beliefs, for instance, in societies that do not eat beef, is another. I don't know why they don't give an example here. I know exactly what they're talking about here. Uh, McDonald's is in India. And remember, a majority part of India is Hindu. The cow is a god. They would never eat cow. So how does McDonald's exist? Uh, they make the hamburger meat from lamb. That's how, oh, that would have been a perfect example in this book. Bad, bad author. You should have given an example. You don't excite the student's awareness and then not give an example. So you got that from me. So you can send uh, donations uh, to my email. Thank you. Uh, accordingly, international business people <coughs> were among the first to note the process of localization in which the formerly local, formerly local, goes global and then becomes local again as diverse or different groups adopt and modify it. In other words, just because television or the internet or hip hop music is global, doesn't mean that it is the same everywhere. Very interesting. People in particular times and places pull down elements from the global circulation of culture and make them their own. Again, uh, for example, I'll tell you something. Uh, let's say, uh, here, okay. Uh, I'm not having uh, interaction. I don't see my students, but uh, I would ask Korean people that are familiar with Koreatown, say, look at a Korean menu at Korean restaurants, you know, whether it's a bulgogi restaurant or you know, tteokbokki, you know, you name it, jajamyeon, jambon, whatever. Look at that menu. Now, think like an American person, right? Not a Korean. Think like an American person. And uh, what do you think the weak point of the menu is for the American person? Usually when I ask that question, a lot of people cannot they don't get it. They're like, well, what do you mean the weak point? Because again, I, I'm trying to get them not to think like a Korean. Because in a Korean's mind, everything's ken jana, right? Everything's okay. But think like an American. So if they can't, they can't. So what it is is that these Korean menus and all these different Korean restaurants, they don't have dessert. And the fat Americans like we are, we love dessert. Now, years ago, uh, you know, because I'm a little bit older than you folks. We had uh, Japanese folks here before Korean, so there was Japanese restaurants before even uh, Koreatown was uh, given its name by the mayor at the time, which I think was the early 80s. 
So that was the same issue with uh, Japanese restaurants. So a lot of American people would go have Japanese food and then say, well, I gotta go to a Denny's, for example, and I'm gonna go get a slice of apple pie or I'm gonna get some ice cream, right? So some wise Japanese restaurant owners said, we're losing money on that deal. We should do something about that. And uh, somebody came up with the idea of green tea ice cream and it was a hit was a hit. Now, why Korean restaurant owners can't think of that nowadays, I don't know, you know, but uh, that was a hit. So now what I'm saying here is now, once it gets to, like it says here, formerly local goes global and then becomes local again as diverse groups adopt and modify it. So it kind of just stayed where you're like, oh boy, I love going to this Japanese restaurant. They have the greatest green tea ice cream, right? Now, in the last number of years, I've noticed this modification in, in America, they do everything with it. Oh, a green tea shake, a green tea cake, a green tea brownie, a green tea cookie, right? So things can remodify over time. So now again, we're back to the relocation and dislocation, which means kind of like kicking out or moving people that don't want to move of peoples. Uh, colonialism meant that mobility and circulation of goods, money, ideas, and institutions, but above all else, it meant the movement of people. So uh, Europeans invaded areas previously beyond their reach or totally unknown to them. Native people conversely had to move aside, sometimes after violent confrontation, which means fighting, and genocide, which means the attempt to wipe out the whole race of people. At best, indigenous societies or their remnants, the people left over after the fighting, were resettled or moved to at the convenience of the colonial regimes to better control them, civilize them, and sometimes extinguish them or we go back to the word genocide to exterminate them, kill them all. In New Spain, Mexico and Latin America, that was the original name, Nueva España, New Spain. Um, the native inhabitants were transferred to reducciones, mission settlements where they were subjected to religious conversion. So drop your Indian beliefs and you must believe in Catholicism forced labor, corporal punishment, which whippings, and floggings, whatever they had at the time. See again, in the term of whipping and shackling, so that puts you in a iron chains. Similarly, in early New England, the natives were consigned to so-called praying towns, such as those administered by John Eliot in the 1600s where their every action could be monitored and regulated. So they would watch them all the time. Kind of like what they're doing now, like let's say, and uh, my buddy told me in London, there's cameras on every street and every corner. You're watched all the time. Uh, no say so in the matter. So these people were monitored in a different way. In the independent United States, Native Americans were compelled or made to surrender their land and move usually westward as the infamous, which means famous, but not in a good way, a bad way, Indian removal or trail of tears that sent Cherokee people to Indian country, later Oak, Lahoma, which is another Indian name, after 1838. Many other tribes were transplanted too, including the Shawnee, Ottawa, Patawatomi, Sauk, and Mesakawaki, uh, Navajo, or Dine, were sent on their own long walk in 1864. Surviving tribes were regulated to reservations, which I'm sure you've heard that term now. Usually small and often inhospitable, which means like you can't, it's very almost impossible to live there. Portions of their ancestral land or areas far from their ancestral land. So, you know, an inhospitable area is like, hey, here's your new land, go live in the desert. Like, uh oh, can't find any water, there's no tree for shade. You know, 
what animals can we eat here? Oh, a snake, that's it? Oh, Jesus. But what about fruit? Well, there's a cactus. Like, so that's what they're saying here. Now, you go on a, something you might not have thought about, but it, it is unimportant. It does carry weight here, okay? It is important. It'd be fascinating to know that, but I'll explain it. Tourism. Travel and cultural consumption. And consumption means when like people consume, well, like I can consume food, right, as a person, but people also consume the goods that they buy, the gas that they buy, clothes, electronics, you name it. That's why they say we're a consumer nation. Always got to buy stuff. Uh, one of the most common and widely accepted forms of global circula uh, circulation of people and culture, but one that only began to receive serious anthropological attention in the 70s. So they weren't even seriously considering that. They didn't real. I think it's because they didn't realize it is tourism. Most of us take tourism for granted. Ah, tourism is tourism, right? People just want to travel. But it actually raises a large number of deep questions about wealth and power, ritual, aesthetics, which means beauty aesthetics, identity, who or what you are, and authenticity. What is, the, what is your real authenticity? and rural urban interactions, right? It's just like, I, I, you probably don't follow, I'm trying to remember her name now. I'm getting confused with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But um, there's a, you know, a politician, a woman that was running for presidency, you know, and uh, she's basically, uh, you know, a Caucasian woman, there's nothing wrong with that. But I guess to gain extra votes, uh, she said actually she's a part uh, American Indian. So how authentic was that? So a lot of American Indian people said, uh, what? And they investigated her and then they, she was forced to admit that she might have an 86th drop of American Indian blood, but uh, culturally, who she was, what she ate, who she was raised by has nothing to do with being Indian. So her authenticity was not very good, right? Again, she's trying to gain votes. In a similar way, a lot of people that run for president say, I came from a poor background and I it was hard to get education and we suffered. Then you find out the true story that this family had money and they never suffered a day in their life. But they want to put that out there to gain votes, right? Okay. The anthropological study of tourism is often traced to Theron Nunez's 1963 article about weekendismo. Now, see, look at this. Here's another example. Weekend, we know, is an English word. But he's going to talk about this mix of tourism with Mexicans and uh, let's say Caucasian uh, American people. Dismo comes from Spanish. So he made up this word and put it together. It really doesn't exist, but to him, he uses it, right? So weekendismo was the name of his article in Mexican society. Okay. Before 1960, Cajititlan, which is a, a Aztec name, not Nahuatl is the language, was a little known peasant or poor people's village in the vicinity or area of the city of Guadalajara. But in that year, two developers bought some lakeshore land, encouraged the government to build a road, and began to promote, hey, visits to the village. It's a cool place to be. So this is actually about Mexican, Mexican tourism, not, nothing to do with Americans, at least at the beginning. Soon well-to-do Mexicans, see, and a few Americans were attracted to the site for the weekend. Hey, it's a cool place, nice lake, pretty. We can go picnicking, swimming, boating, and water skiing. And wealthier visitors bought lakefront property in 1963. While locals benefited in various ways from the influx or coming in of tourists, they also faced new burdens, problems, and restrictions. 
They were forbidden from hunting with guns in the surrounding area because they might kill a tourist by accident. Prohibited from driving livestock through the town streets. So if you owned a lot of cattle, you could not, not now you could not put them through the streets because again, you're endangering folks. And punished for wearing, I didn't know about this, punished for wearing their traditional white cotton trousers called calzones on the grounds. They were underwear and hence indecent to the, I guess the richer society. They didn't want to see men walking around panties, so to speak. These measures were undertaken and enforced unilaterally, which means everywhere, with the idea that the village would be more suitable and safer for tourists. So what he's trying to say here is that the desires of the tourists were uh, catered to more than the people who lived there. Members of the community were not consulted. So they didn't ask them, is that cool that we ask you not to wear your underwear? Or is that cool that we, you can't bring cattle through here or try to hunt? First of all, rivalries between men of different neighborhoods were created or intensified. So people got jealous of what was going on there. Maybe they thought, you know, it'd be kind of like, you know, let's say it's uh, K-Town and then the Olympic Street um, neighbors were upset with the uh, Western Avenue neighbors and said, well, the, you put more businesses on Western Avenue and they're making more money than we can. That's not fair. So they probably started fighting. In the end, Nunez concluded quite rightly that tourism may bring rapid and dramatic changes in the loci or local area of authority, land use patterns, value systems, and portions of an economy, that it is a legitimate necessary area of culture change research, and that the study of tourism may provide another laboratory situation for the testing of acculturation theory. So he's trying to say that if you have a prolonged period of time, I'm thinking he's thinking more in a foreign land, not so much Mexico, Mexico, that you have this tourism thing set up there with a different language and culture. It will influence uh, the other side, you know, and vice versa, the longer that you have it there, right? So it's another way to study cultural anthropology, okay? All right. So on to the questions. Okay, so I told you earlier, I gave you a heads up, a hinty poo. Explain innovation and that fusion. So give me the explanation, the uh, definition of innovation, and then the fusion. This is a two-parter. Again, it's a Good practice for your tests because I will still get, like, let's say this comes on the midterm, right? I constantly try to remind people, I, I want you guys to get A's. I want you to do as best as you can. You put the effort, why shouldn't you, right? But if you're lazy, that's another issue. So I still have students that, let's say I give this exact question. And, uh, they will only answer the first one. So I can't give them the full points on this, right? Some teachers would even just say, well, that's completely wrong because you didn't include the second one. So you get no points. I'll give you points, but I can't give you points if you don't give me definition. So please listen to me. I know I have students that sometimes just read the material and they turn off my voice, which is fine. I don't have the sexiest voice, sorry. I'm not uh, Alex Hong, but... Uh, you know, I try to help you by talking to you. So do both, please. Okay, two, what is cultural movement? That's a pretty short answer. You can explain that in just a few words. It shouldn't be difficult. Three, name some types of cultural revitalization. So there was a little list there. So again, I will repeat this too. 
let's say there's a list of six, at least give me three because some means more than one. And I'll get some students, same thing, they'll give me one answer. Person that gives me two on the list gets more, three more. I don't necessitate that you give me all six. That's up to you. But three or four is pretty good. You should get the maximum points there, okay? That's just another hint for you. Okay, four. I told you it was going to be there. Explain syncretism, right? So don't, don't be one of my silly guys and say, isn't that when you mix uh, scotch and vodka and some grape from juice? Isn't that a syncretism? But no, no, my friend. I'm sorry, that's not the case. Okay, what is globalization? Oh, let me give you a hint. This is a new thing, okay? Just to let you guys know. Here's another way that students uh, hurt themselves, okay? Again. Instead of the student that listens to my lecture, goes through the material. This is even braver student. The braver student kind of says, I'm too busy partying or what happened because they're so brave and they're so smart. So then let's say for the midterm, I give this question. Now, usually the answer for the material and what I give you in the lecture is not too long. It's pretty short. Makes it easier for you to get an A. But this student didn't pay attention to anything, didn't watch anything. So they'll just say, oh, I'll just look up Wikipedia and I'll see what's in Wikipedia. And they'll give me like a eight or nine sentence answer to globalization. That really shows me they didn't uh, study what we were studying here for cultural anthropology, okay? So just be aware of that, okay? I'm trying to give you the easy ways here, okay, six. List some dimensions of Erickson's globalization. I kept on telling you when we reach a name, this person's an author, that person's an author. So I mentioned Erickson and just list some, again, not all of the dimensions of what he considers globalization. And you should be fine. Okay, seven. Colonialism above all else meant the movement of what? So again, that's kind of a short answer. So you can do it again. I'm wary of my funny guys that the movements of cars on the freeway, is that what we're talking about? No, sorry. Okay. Eight. What was the main reason for transferring populations during colonialism? Again, I've had my funny guys in the past, say silly things like, well, the real estate, you know, that's why they did it. Uh, real estate's cheaper in Las Vegas, so that's why you move. Again, we're talking about the time of colonialism. Forced movings. They listed quite a few native people there, so don't give me the funny stuff, okay? Nine. So it's at the top of the page. Tourism raises deep question about what? So again, I don't want to hear. Well, it raises deep questions about what's the number one um, honeymoon destination for Americans. That's Hawaii. That's what that's what they're talking about, right? I bet you guys can't uh, uh, remember before Hawaii, and I think Hawaii. And that started in the 70s, that Hawaii became the number one honeymoon destination for American people. I bet nobody here can guess what it was before them. If you watch old movies and some old TV shows, they will say it over and over and you can see it. So you want me to tell you? Okay, Niagara Falls. Okay, that border between Canada and the United States and the beautiful falls. Uh, that was the honeymoon, number one honeymoon destination before, I guess. Uh, and I can only guess the 70s because they started having these TV shows like Hawaii Five-O and movie shows about Hawaii. And people said, man, got to go there. So there you go. Now, you know something that some American people your own age won't even know. You can ask them, 
Hey, before Hawaii, where did people go for honeymoon? Oh, I don't know, Las Vegas. No, sorry. Okay, next. The anthropological study of tourism is often traced to whom and what. Okay, hint, hint. Hint, hint. They're talking about that author who wrote that article. So, boom, give his name. And then what was the name of the article? And I'll give you some extra points if you can tell me what the article was about, okay? That would be the same way if this showed up in the midterm, okay? And there's a good chance a lot of these will, all right? So I ran through the questions well enough for you there. I hope so. You should be finishing those pretty quickly, all right? So let me wrap this thing up here. Hit the old stop share. And there I am again. Hey, back at you. So have a good time. Again, this you're set to receive this the 25th of uh, July. That's when this lesson is coming out. Okay, so enjoy it. And I think you find it this lesson more modern and contemporary than the really past things that we did. Okay. So until that time, take care. I will end this. So.